Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Welcome to the USAID's Kitchen Sink Food Loss and Waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian, a food loss and waste advisor at USAID, and I'm joined today by Adam Fry of Budgie, a direct consumer mobile app that serves as a digital kitchen assistant. Today, we'll be discussing the magnitude of the problem of household food waste, some of the causes, some of the ways to address it, and discussing how we can change the narrative around food waste. So welcome, Adam. Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for uh, having me, Nika. It's exciting to be here while we're at ReFed. I'm doing this live. Um, So my name is Adam Fry, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder at Bajit. And as you mentioned, Bajit is a direct-to-consumer mobile application that functions as a digital kitchen assistant with the triple aim of helping people eat better, save money, and waste less. And the way that we do this is basically we help folks find recipes in a very personalized way, uh, build meal plans, generate shopping lists, and then manage their fridge and their pantry. And so using technology to basically bring cooking at home into the 21st century. Thanks for that introduction, Adam. It's really interesting to learn more about Budget, and really excited to talk to you today. We're very familiar with the statistic of 30 to 40 percent of the food that we produce is either lost or wasted. And consumer food waste plays a huge role in that statistic. And we know that on average, the average U.S. household wastes about 32 percent of their food, which is over $1,800 a year in wasted food and at a time where people are very conscious of their grocery bills. That's a staggering number. Um, Mm -hmm. So I I would like to invite you to set the stage and and discuss the magnitude of consumer food waste and what are some of the causes? Yeah. Um, So as you mentioned, it is an astronomical amount of food that's wasted. Uh, Dana Gunder is the executive director of ReFed here, um, has an analogy along the lines of, you know, imagine going to the grocery store every week, walking out into the parking lot with three bags of groceries and dropping one directly to the floor and not bothering to pick it up, right? It's sort of uh, amazing to think about, but that's basically what we're doing Mm -hmm. day in, day out, week after week, month after month here in the United States and in many other developed countries. And so the aggregate impact of that is that around 50%, so 48% is the latest estimate, half of all total food loss and waste comes from households. So it's by far the largest single contributor Mm -hmm. to food loss and waste in the United States and in most other developed economies. Um, And so when you think about that in terms of environmental impact, that means that around 12 or so percent of all freshwater use in the United States is attributable to food that later we put in the trash bin. Um, Similar percentage, around 12% or so of all the stuff that we're sending to landfills is food that we've thrown out in our kitchen bin. Um, If we stopped wasting food in North America alone, we could feed 130 million people per year. And so it's just astronomical. Yeah, the, the implications for, as you mentioned, nutrition, climate, economic development are are really dramatic and as you said food waste consumer food waste is a problem both domestically and internationally and at a time where we're facing a global food crisis and staggering amounts of food insecurity that food is is too good to waste so can you outline some of the the opportunities to address consumer food waste how can we tackle this problem yeah yeah So I think first to think about the solutions, it's important to understand a little bit about the causes, right? And often the two causes are bucketed into into big groups and we can peel back the layers of the onion to understand what are the root causes, but the two big groups are generally uh, over preparing, so just making too much food, whether or not that's served, um, and then also food that has gone or has perceived to have gone bad, so spoilage. And so just to dig a layer, layer deeper on each of those, 
um, for the latter, right, the food that is spoiled or is perceived to have spoiled, a lot of that actually hasn't spoiled. Um, we're throwing out a ton of perfectly edible food um, in the United States and in countries across the world. And so one of the causes of this is um, spoilage or perceived spoilage, right? And so we're actually throwing out a ton of food that's perfectly safe to eat. Um, and when you dig down deeper on this, um, you know, a reason is date label confusion. Mm -hmm. And so there's a ton of food um, that's perfectly good that we're throwing out because there's a date printed on it, which may say best buy, use by, sell by, or perhaps a date without any descriptor whatsoever. Um, that has nothing to do with food safety. But yet the perception at large is that this is the date after which food is no longer safe to eat. And so we end up throwing out a ton of perfectly good food. And when you jump back to that first cause, over-preparation, you know, digging down a layer deeper as an example, one cause is really cultural norms, right? And so in many places in the world, including the U.S. still, um, serving an abundant amount of food uh, is seen as a sign of prosperity, of love, of affection, and the perceived risk of underserving or under-preparing food is much greater than the perceived risk of over-preparing or over-serving food. And, you know, it's going to take a lot to unwind those sort of norms and really uh, illustrate the negative impact that over-preparation actually has. Mm -hmm. You made some really excellent points, Adam. I think, as you said, that the connection between food safety and food loss and waste cannot be underestimated. And it's definitely something that we need to consider when we're talking about consumer awareness and consumer education. They really do go hand in hand. And your second point really tees up our, our final question, which is, perhaps the most complicated and difficult to, to address. And, and one of the, the biggest obstacles I think we face in, in our food waste warrior position, and one of the major goals of this podcast is how do we change the narrative around food loss and waste? As you mentioned, it's a cultural norm to, to overbuy and overproduce food, and it's socially acceptable to waste that food. So how do we really communicate to consumers that wasting this food has really huge implications for nutrition, for climate, for your own wallet? How do we change the narrative around wasting food? I think that's really exactly right. You know, we need to shift the narrative. And in order to shift the narrative, we also need you know, tangible solutions first. And I think about solutions in these three broad buckets. One is awareness and education. The second is creating the right incentive structures. And finally, you need to make it easy to do the right thing using technology. And so digging each, into each of those a little bit, in the awareness and education front, we are seeing a lot of really positive changes happening. You have grassroots movements like Food Waste Prevention Week, which is happening now, started in the States, and now is sort of a global um, co co collaboration between you know, um, nonprofits, um, government entities, for-profit business, just a variety of stakeholders coming together. Um, you have other things like Stop Food Waste Day or simple things like share tables in educational institutions, either driven by nonprofits or by the institutions themselves, right? Kids can go and take food that's edible that they're not going to eat, place it on the share table. Other kids can take it. It can be reused in another meal service or it can be donated to folks who need that food. And the impact of something like that isn't just directly on the food that's now not going to the landfill, but it's also when they come home and they see mommy and daddy throwing out perfectly good food and they start to ask really tricky questions. And then families start to change behavior because they realize we're not setting a good example for our kids. Um, in the second bucket around incentives, I think a lot of this is economic. You made a great point at the start of the uh, podcast. We're wasting $1,800 to $2,000 worth of food per person in the United States already. And so some of that economic incentive is built in and we just need to make people aware. You could go on a food waste vacation every year if you, know, you just stopped wasting food. Literally, you could go on a great vacation. I think on the economic side, there's also other stakeholders involved. So for example, municipalities. I live in New York City. New York City spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year just processing um, and disposing of residential food waste, mm -hmm. right? If we put a dent in that, that's tens of millions of dollars a year that could be used to invest in the community, right? We could literally cut people rebate checks at the end of the year, right? But or things like building playgrounds, building schools, all that type of stuff to create the right incentive structure to show people there's real value to food waste and there's real value to food waste reduction. A lot of that, I think, is underpinned by the right legislative and uh, policy um, priorities. And so 
you know, whether you do things, extreme examples, like in South Korea, where they'll fine you if you produce too much organic food waste. I don't think that would fly in the United <laughs> States. We have examples like in California, right, where now every resident of the state has to have access to a municipal or other um, organic waste disposal service. Mm -hmm. And so I think some exciting things even, you know, at the federal level and statewide that's bubbling up, carbon pricing, right? And so if you create these legislative and policy um, priorities that support the economic initiatives, I think that's a, that's a powerful tool for change. Mm -hmm. And then finally, in that third bucket, you know, technology, that's really our bread and butter at Budgie, right? Why the heck do I need to remember what's in my fridge every day? Uh, rack my brain, what's for dinner, right? Think about how can I remix these ingredients that are left over to make something delicious? A lot of people don't have that skill set. Mm -hmm. And that's stuff that technology is really good at, right? We can make it easy to do the right thing by supporting people in their pursuits. And it's not just us at Budgie, you know, I think there's other interesting company, Olio, and a litany of others. And so I think through awareness and education, creating the right incentive structures, and then finally making it easy to do the right things with technology, you can really create the basis to change the narrative, mm -hmm. which I think is then a tougher question, right? Um, and that I don't have a great answer for, <laughs> frankly. How do you create real cultural and societal change? Uh, I am encouraged because we've seen it happen in other instances. Mm -hmm. For example, the plastic straws, um, right? You have these really um, visceral images of turtles uh, with you know straws stuck in their nose that came out that motivated a huge change, mm -hmm. seemingly overnight, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have examples like Carson's uh, Silent Spring, right? Um, that sort of sends shivers down your spine, right? There's an emotional reaction. And so I think to really create sustainable cultural change around this, one, we need the sort of bread and butter solutions that I described, mm -hmm. but then also we need to probably have an emotional connection to food waste and really we have people feel it when they waste food at home before we end residential food waste for all. Absolutely. I mean, as you said, money talks. So whether you're you're chatting with the consumer, the private sector, or government, those economic arguments are the ones that really hit home. So thinking about messaging, but as you said, also thinking about the infrastructure. Do they have access to the facilities that help them divert or reduce their own food waste? And and policy is is a large part of that. And storytelling is another huge component. We've heard that come up quite a bit at the ReFed Summit, is collecting these stories that are going to be persuasive to consumers. I love the, I love the food waste vacation. That's, I mean, yeah. but it, it really is that significant of an amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I think our challenge now is, is what are the most compelling and attractive arguments that we can make not only to consumers, but the private sector, to farmers, to government, all across the value chain. I think the stories have to be really targeted because everyone has different interests at heart and different stories are going to hit home. Um, so I think it is really incumbent upon us to start thinking about those stories. What is going to be the catalyst for food waste? Like you said, the, the turtle and the plastic straw. What is that visceral story, that image that needs to come to mind when we think about food waste? And Youth has they youth have a large role to play in this. They are early adopters of technology. They're going to be the ones most likely to use these apps. They're the ones that are going to take the messages that they're learning in media and at school back home and apply it to their household. So I think in in line with thinking of these stories, I think we really need to appeal to youth and what are the stories that are going to really hit home and bring this message of reducing food waste make that hit home for them, have them bring that back into their household. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and it was a pleasure being on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And it's an exciting environment to do this podcast in, here where we're seeing innovation happen before our eyes at the ReFed Summit. Absolutely, Adam. A lot of great storytelling happening here. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able, I'm so glad we were able to sit down and capture some of your thoughts. It's really great to to discuss the problem of household uh, food waste and, and some of the solutions and paths forward so that we can tackle this problem together. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, 
Ahmed Kablan, and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition. Thank <laughs> you.